Fans were hyped when it was announced that Kim Henkel, co-writer of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, was taking the helm of the fourth film in the franchise and promising to deliver something along the lines of the first movie, a scary, down-and-dirty, independent film shot in Texas. So when Henkel's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, was finally released, Years after production had wrapped, and the audience that had been waiting so long saw that the movie was packed with ridiculous, over-the-top characters, and hence that the Backwoods family at the heart of the series were actually working for the Illuminati, it made many of us ask, what the f**k happened to this horror movie? You won't see the name Robert Kuhn anywhere on Toby Hooper's 1974 classic, but the Austin-based lawyer was instrumental in getting the movie made. He's one of the film's investors and the filmmaker's legal advisor, helping them form the production company and the investor corporation. As the franchise moved forward, he retained a financial interest in it, and when one of the other rights holders died, he bought that person's chainsaw interest. So when he approached Hooper's Chainsaw co-writer, Kim Henkel, about getting a new sequel into production, they already had, by Kuhn's estimation, around 80 to 90% of the franchise rights secured, since Henkel was president of the corporation that owned half of the rights. Although New Line Cinema had put their best effort to turn Chainsaw into a major Hollywood moneymaker, with 1990's Leatherface, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, which is a pretty good time, honestly. The film had been a box office failure, so New Line abandoned their plans to make multiple movies, and the rest is history. Now, Kuhn wanted to make sure the series wouldn't go dormant, and he was tired of letting companies like Canon and New Line make sequels, since he hadn't been happy with the results. For his part, Henkel didn't seem really pleased with any of the Chainsaw movies to date. He wasn't quite sure what fans and critics saw in the original. It was nothing but a crude backyard movie that a bunch of kids slept together. His quote, not mine. As far as he was concerned, he could only see the flaws when he watched it. He felt that Hooper's version had been compromised on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. In part 3, well, he and Kuhn agreed that that one was a disappointment. Still, he wasn't enthusiastic about making one of these movies himself. It took years to convince him to write the screenplay for the fourth film. And more pushing was required to get him to agree to make his feature directorial debut with Chainsaw 4. And decades later, The Next Generation remains Henkel's only directing credit. The title in the script Henkel wrote was Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He didn't want a number in the title to mark this as just another sequel. He didn't care to address the events of part two and three. His objective here was to revitalize the franchise with the real sequel following the structure of the original film and featuring some similar characters. Kind of like what the Halloween franchise has been doing for years. For example, one of Leatherface's family members in Henkel's film is W.E., who is essentially the cook from the original and part two uh, all over again. In fact, he might be the same person since he runs a gas station, just like the cook did. And even though part two said the cook's name was Drayton Sawyer, the sign on the gas station in the first movie implies his name was W.E. Slaughter. It has been said that the original actor was offered the chance to reprise the role of the cook, but turned it down. Instead, the role went to Joe Stevens. W.E.'s dialogue consists largely of historical and literary quotes, a character element that was inspired by a strange argument Henkel witnessed between the Texas Chainsaw Massacre assistant cameraman, who also played LG in part two, and Perryman's father, who kept dropping quotes in the middle of their fight. <laughs> Gunnar Hansen, the original Leatherface, was approached to return as well, but he was asking for about 3,500 a week. The low-budget production refused to offer him any more than 600, so Hansen chose to refuse. Henkel went then searching for someone who was more of a androgynous type, since he intended to play up the fact that Leatherface portrays different genders, depending on which human skin mask is being worn at any given moment. The search ended when he found Robert Jacks, who was also a musician and contributed some music to the film, a song he wrote and performed with Blondie's Debbie Harry. Chainsaw 4 was filmed just outside of Austin, Texas, and nearly every cast member was a local. Now, most of the cast were unknowns and still are to this day, but there are a couple standouts who had quickly become big-time Hollywood stars. Math McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. By the time they came aboard, they had both been in the Richard Linklater classic Days and Confused. McConaughey had a prominent and memorable role, while looking for Zellweger in the movie is like playing Where's Waldo. 
Makande was originally looking at playing a smaller role in Chainsaw. A handsome biker character would have a scene early on and then reappear at the end to ride off into the sunset with our heroine. A role that ended up being cut entirely, so when we do see a motorcycle in the finished film, it's just a random passerby. -er. Makane thought he wouldn't have time to play a larger part because he was planning to move out to Hollywood soon. But, but on second thought, he decided to stay in Texas a while longer to play the most insane character in the film, a truck driver named Vilmer. As troubled as this movie turned out to be, McConaughey's Vilmer is one of its highlights. He really put his all into making sure the character came off as dangerous and unhinged as possible. And here we go! <laughs> and the result is a performance that even gets praise from viewers who hate everything else about the movie. While speaking with Fangoria magazine, Hankel put down the original villains from the Chainsaw film as outlandish and buffoonish saying the villains in his movie would be more credible and thus more frightening. That is not the case. But McConaughey certainly tried. Zellweger was cast as the heroine Jenny, a mousy girl with a bad home life who gradually finds her inner strength as the film goes along. Jenny and her peers, who become victims, cross paths with the family on prom night because Hankel figured you can't get more American than teenagers on prom night. And it's these teen characters who gave the viewers the first hint that this film was not going to live up to the quality of the original. Henkel told Fangoria that he'd written well-drawn characters he would feel empathy for, but he has since admitted that he wrote these characters to be cartoonish representations of American teens, knowing that few teens are like this in reality. Viewers who weren't warned about that in advance found this to be quite jarring. The cartoonish style isn't exclusive to the teens. It runs throughout the entire movie. You can see it in the fact that Vilmer has a remote controlled mechanical leg brace, or that his girlfriend Darla goes on and on about her breast implants, feeds the family who were previously known to be cannibals with vegetarian pizza, and claims she has a bomb located in her head. Now the original script went even further with this. When the teens arrive at the home of Leatherface and the family, they were meant to find a local band jamming in one of the rooms. The band would be shown casually leaving the home later, thanking the family for letting them practice there. Now, if that had been in the movie, it would have been just as confounding, if not more, than the late arrival of a character named Rothman, played by James Gale, an actor who had to commute all the way from Houston. With bad things happening to a small group of people in one place, like in the first Chainsaw movie, Henkel wanted to widen the scope with his film. He wanted to tell the audience that they couldn't be comfortable with the idea that there is just a minor, isolated incident, because there is something far larger going on here. And so we have Rothman a well-dressed man with strange symbols carved into his stomach, a person who gets around in a chauffeured limousine and seems to be a representative of the Illuminati. The director presents the idea that Leatherface and his cohorts are unwillingly working for the Illuminati, being forced to show people the meaning of horror so they can achieve some kind of transcendental experience. Now, the writer slash director did not confirm whether or not he really intended the family to be connected to a worldwide organization or if Rothman had just managed to trick them into thinking they were working for the Illuminati. He doesn't like to talk about it, leaving it up to the individual viewer to interpret and come to their own conclusion. Now, a lot of Chainsaw fans have come to the conclusion that this Illuminati stuff shouldn't have been in a Chainsaw movie. And it is hard to argue against that. Hankel and Kuhn raised the budget to make the film themselves so they could retain creative control of the project. Now, according to online trivia, this one had a budget of 600,000. And if that's accurate, it means this cost 10 times more than the original. Production took place for the course of seven weeks in the summer of 1994, and seems to have gone rather smoothly. The finished film was shopped around to distributors, with the US distribution rights going to Columbia TriStar. But that wasn't exactly the triumphant outcome the filmmakers were hoping for. By the time the company started planning the release, Matthew McConaughey had already been cast in the high-profile John Grisham adaptation, A Time to Kill. And soon after, Renee Zellweger was cast alongside Tom Cruise and Jerry Maguire. So Columbia TriStar decided to wait until after those movies were released so they can take advantage of Chainsaw 4's unexpected star power. Now the problem was, McConaughey had signed with Creative Artist Agency. And the filmmakers alleged that the CAA pressured Columbia TriStar to bury the film because McConaughey's representatives saw it as an improper exploitation of his success. But at the same time, wouldn't you do the same? 
Now, whatever the holdup was, it led to multiple lawsuits. Even though Henkel and Kuhn held the majority of Chainsaw rights, they still had to option the right to make a sequel, just like Canon and New Line had done, because it was up to the trustee, attorney Charles Grigson, to make the final decision for the franchise. When the film hadn't been released by mid-97, Grigson sued TriStar and the production companies for breach of the distribution agreement. Now, Grigson eventually dropped the case when TriStar sought to enforce the arbitration clause in their contract. He then teamed up with Hankel and Kuhn to sue McConaughey and creative artists. This was quite a mess, and the legal issues weren't even resolved until the year 2000. By that time, the film had already been given a limited theatrical release, as well as dumped on home video. Along the way, the distributor had decided that Henkel's director's cut needed some, uh, extra editing done to it. The film that reached theaters and home video under the title Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation didn't quite match the vision Henkel had for the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The writer slash director was not consulted as someone else cut six minutes out of his movie, with some of these cuts seeming to be totally random. The biggest loss is an early scene with Jenny, where we see that she is a creepy, threatening stepfather. Now, Henkel put that scene in the film to start off Jenny's character arc. We're meant to see her become stronger over the course of the movie as she starts standing up to the people who bully her. The experience with the homicidal, potentially Illuminati-employed family helps her grow as a person. Now, with the removal of the stepfather scene, Jenny lost an important part of her story. Other cuts are just a loss of seconds here and there, but they take their toll. Now, Chainsaw 4 isn't the most well-made movie out there, but some of these arbitrary cuts make the filmmakers look incompetent, when it wasn't actually their fault. Thankfully, Hankel's director's cut has also made its way into the world, most recently with Screen Factory's Blu-ray. The real happy ending here is that Zellweger and McConaughey, despite what their reps may or may not have tried to pull back in the day, have both acknowledged the film and said positive things about it. In a 2016 interview with Yahoo, she said that she was so grateful and so excited to get the chainsaw job. She made lasting friendships with both McConaughey and Jax during the production. Sadly, Jax passed away in 2001. McConaughey may not have exactly known which Chainsaw movie he was in. He called it part three during an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel. But in 2011, he said it was a lot of fun to make. Henkel didn't feel compelled to make his own Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He was pushed into the gig. He had some interesting ideas. He had some bad ideas. And none of them felt fully realized in the final film. But the next generation does have its own quirky charms, and McConaughey alone is enough to make it worth watching at least once. Right, all right, all right. How often do you get to see McConaughey go full Nicolas Cage? Hey, thanks for watching our show. Please subscribe to our Joe Blow Horror Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. Listen, we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support. Gone has seeds sound deciding. When you say a prayer and you put him in the ground, you speak a whiskey and it's mark bound. Ain't no new shit going down on the soap streets of Blue Island.